Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. Today, we will be discussing the motion picture from 1981, Escape from New York. Joining me today are my co-hosts, Noel. Hello. Julia. Hi. And special guest, Kevin. Hey, you know, and I'm not high on Sudafed and NyQuil this episode. No. So <laughs> that'll be an interesting change for you. I'm glad you at least had that hour and a half now that you can still remember what you talked about. <laughs> it's a snapshot. Like, <laughs> oh, I can remember it. Are you going to still spontaneously jump into Foghorn Lakehorn John Carpenter impersonations? I was just about to say, you know, I might as well do that for continuity's sake. We insist. <laughs> <laughs> so, boy, I said, boy. We should always just try to prepare like a snippet of the Carpenter quote from an audio commentary that Kevin can read in that fashion. (laughs) I don't care that that's not how he sounds. That's how he sounds in my head from now on. (laughs) It's canon. He actually doesn't sound that different from how you normally sound, which is what makes it funnier. (laughs) (laughs) So, yes, Escape from New York. It premiered July 10th, 1981 in the U.S., though it actually debuted in Japan two months earlier, which doesn't surprise me because there was this whole wave of like early 80s post-apocalypse movies, Warriors, Road Warrior, Escape from New York, that you can see those movies in all of the anime of the 80s. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That became like this huge template that so much of that was built on. And we'll definitely get to the character of Romero in this movie is especially a 80s anime character. (laughs) So yes, the film was directed, co-written, and co-scored by John Carpenter. He and Nick Castle, a name we've mentioned in the past, originally wrote the film in 1974, the year Dark Star was released. In 1980, after stepping down from Philadelphia Experiment, Carpenter needed a second film to fulfill a two-picture deal he had with Avco Embassy, so he dusted this script off. The budget was only $6 million, and it pulled in a total U.S. gross of $25 million. And in order to keep the costs low, the special effects were outsourced to Roger Corman's New World, where they were supervised by a fellow you may have heard about by the name of James Cameron. Or Jim Cameron. (laughs) Yes, who was just about to make his own directorial debut with Piranha 2 The Spawning. (laughs) Classic. So yes, this is not only the only collaboration of John Carpenter and James Cameron, but the only collaboration of John Carpenter and Roger Corman. Nice. Who didn't really have anything to do with the film. His studio did the effects. Oh, I got a bit of a list here. Returning from past Carpenter films, we have the actors Kurt Russell, Donald Pleasant, Susan Hubley, Adrian Barbeau, Tom Atkins, Charles Cyphers. Yes, I got both of them together for once. <laughs> Frank Doubleday, John Strobel, Nancy Stevens, George Buckflowers, and Jamie Lee Curtis as the voice of the opening narrator. I didn't know that. (laughs) Yeah, that was her. And that was a scene that they had to add in later on because they felt we didn't explain things enough. Hmm. So they just slipped that in, called her up, say, hey, can you read this for us? Sure. Also returning, we have producer Deborah Hill, associate producer Barry Bernardi, producer and first assistant director Larry Franco, cinematographer Dean Cundy, costume designer Stephen Loomis, sound mixer Tom Causey, boom operator Joe Brennan, graphic artist John Walsh, stunt performers Megs Kavana and James Winburn, electrician Scott Butfield and Steve Mathis, still photographer Kim Gottlieb, second unit DP Douglas Knapp, gaffer Mark Walther, cameraman Ray Stella and Douglas Olivares, producer and casting assistant Peggy Brotman, and script supervisor Louis Jaffe. So it's still a lot of the same people that he worked on the last few films with, plus a whole bunch of new people coming in from New World. Some new names to add to the list. Actor Harry Dean Stanton, who will also appear in Christine. Actor Carmen Felipe, who will also appear in Halloween 4. Co-composer Alan Haworth will also work on Halloweens 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, as well as Christine, Big Trouble in Little China, Prince of Darkness, and They Live. Editor Tom Ramsey will also work on The Thing and Black Moon Rising. Production designer Joe Alls will go on to be second unit director of Starman. Before this, he was the production designer on Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and in 1983 made his own directorial debut with Jaws 3D. The set decorator Claudia Rebar, then just credited as Claudia, will also work on Christine and Body Bags. Hairstylist Frankie Bergman will also work on Halloween's 2 and 3 and Christine, and later did the hair for the entirety of Full House, which I'm sure Uncle Jesse (laughs) fondly remembers. Makeup supervisor Ken Chase will also work on The Thing of Big Drum Little China. Production manager Alan Levine will also work on They Live. 
See, I'm reading very fast so I can get through these quickly because there's a lot. <laughs> Second assistant director Jeffrey Chernov will also work on The Thing and Starman, as well as be first assistant director on Philadelphia Experiment and production manager on Halloween's 2 and 3. Sound editor Warren Hamilton also worked on Halloween's 2 and 3 and The Thing. Oscar-winning re-recording mixers Greg Landacre, Bill Varney, and Steve Masla will also work on Halloween 2 and The Thing, with Varney and Masla also continuing to work on Halloween 3 and Starman, and Masla doing Christine. All three were just coming off of Empire Strikes Back when they did this. Very cool. Sound editor David Lewis Udall will also work on Halloween's 2, 3, and 5 and The Thing, Christine, and Black Moon Rising. Special effects supervisor Roy Arbogast will also work on The Thing, Christine, Starman, and Village of the Damned. Stunt performer Tony Brubaker, who will also work on They Live, will be the stunt coordinator of Body Bags. We got three more. Stunt coordinator and legendary stuntman Dick Warlock, who had been doubling for Kurt Russell since 1969's Computer War Tennis Shoes, will also work on Halloween's 2 and 3, The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China, and in Halloween 2, he also plays Michael Myers. Stunt performer George Wilbur will go on to play Michael Myers in Halloween's 4 and 6. And production assistant David Deco 2 will go on to become an infamous director of schlock Z-grade trash, helming 116 movies from 1985 to today, including the long-running 1313 and Brotherhood horror franchises and A Talking Cat, starring the voice of Eric Roberts. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> Man, there were so many credits on this film. I think I need to start paring them down. <laughs> Do you need to take a breath now? I need to take a breath because then I got the synopsis, which is like four paragraphs. <laughs> All right. Let me just say while Noel takes a breath that I had actually seen the sequel way, way, way before I saw this. And I thought that it was going to be similar to that. It was not similar to that. My parents had rented Escape from L.A. sometime back in the 90s. I couldn't pinpoint the time. And we watched it and it was not this movie. Yeah. No. <laughs> Julia, you kind of have a similar experience of that, though you're a fan of Escape from L.A. I am indeed. I purchased it on VHS, Sight Unseen, because Steve Buscemi was in it. <laughs> and I enjoyed it thoroughly. And this movie, again, it is not. <laughs> yes. And as I said before, when Escape from L.A. came out was when my dad showed me Escape from New York for the first time. So I got to see them both around the same time. That was also right when I was getting into Carpenter. So I had like, you know, they lived the thing. A whole bunch of stuff all come down right around that same time in 97. And Alex? It's actually getting fuzzy. I can't remember which I saw first. I saw Escape from L.A. in the theater at my cottage where Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn were actually staying nearby Ooh. and my family got to see them. There was um, newspaper articles about people harassing them on their dock and my aunts were some of those people. <laughs> As I'm <laughs> proud and not proud to say. But uh, Escape from New York was one of my late night babysitting films from the aforementioned City TV in Toronto. So I saw that at an early age, and it was one of those late-night, eye-opening films to a lot of the uh, underground or, like, lesser-known cinema. So, yeah, I have a rich history with the Escape franchise. So I will say, you know, Escape from L.A., despite its reputation, and I'll say it any opinion until we get to it and I watch it again. For three of us, that was kind of our introduction for this, because two of you, that was all that you had seen. Me, I've only seen the original at the same time as I saw the sequel. But it's been a while. It's been a while since I've seen either one. Mm -hmm. And Alex, I know you. it's been a while for you. And oh, yeah. Kevin and Julia, this is your first time. It'll be interesting to see where we all stand on this. Absolutely. It's going to be an interesting one. Because Escape from L.A., I think that was like the last window to John Carpenter for like people our age. Yeah, I would say so. All right. So ready for the synopsis? Do it. As the Cold War continues to escalate, tensions rise and crime runs rampant. So a nationwide police force is enacted and the ruins of Manhattan are turned into a walled-off penal colony where prisoners are dumped for life. In 1997, the far-off future date of 1997, <laughs> an anarchist crashes Air Force One into Manhattan, leaving the president in the clutches of the gangs led by the Duke of New York. On top of that, the president is carrying a tape detailing a plan for cold fusion energy, which he hopes to share at an international conference and bring an end to the war. But if he doesn't make it in 24 hours, the conference is canceled and everything stays the same. New York Warden Bob Houck is hesitant to pour his forces in en masse, but it just so happens Snake Plissken, an ex-soldier and notorious outlaw, has been taken into custody. Houck arms and equips Snake, promising him a full pardon if he returns with either the tape or the president, and puts a bomb in his artery to make sure Snake doesn't run off or come in past the end of the conference. Snake enters the city, first stealthily, then more brazenly as he encounters roving sewer crazies and brutal gangs. Along the way, he's helped by a cabbie named Cabby. Brain, a technical genius who works for the Duke, and Maggie, Brain's tough-as-nails lover-slash-handler. All three hope to win their freedom alongside Snake, but when their first attempt goes sour, Snake is captured and forced to fight in the arena, 
while the Duke continues humiliating the President. Another escape is launched, and everyone's roaring down a bridge to the wall. Cabby and Brain are taken out by mimes, uh, <laughs> taken out by mimes, very silently. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby and Brain are taken out by mines while Maggie slows down the Duke until she herself is killed, and the big fight between the Duke and Snake is ended when the President mows down New York's ruler in a hail of gunfire. The President helps Snake out and gives him his promised pardon, but Snake is bitter at how little sympathy the man shows at the lives that were lost to gain him his freedom. Snake walks off and the President opens a live feed to the conference, but when he plays the key cassette tape, it's instead a big band remix from Cabby's Cab, cut to Snake tearing up the real tape as he disappears into the shadows. So, Alex, do you recommend Escape from New York? Oh, God. Um, I don't know. This was one of the weirdest experiences I've had watching Escape from New York. I was watching it with a very critical eye, and I'm almost afraid to say this. I'm on the fence. Really? Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I didn't expect that from you. That's right. I know. I think yes, but this time, this particular viewing, watching it through the eyes of Masters of Carpentry and with my wife, I found it to be a lot slighter than I remember and not playing to the strengths of Kurt Russell, where you have this charismatic and hilarious frontman who would later perfect this with another character who will meet in another John Carpenter film. Captain Ron? And, exactly. Captain Ron. That's <laughs> right. You got it. Hit the nail on the head. And I feel weird going first because I feel very naked right now, guys. <laughs> it doesn't help that I'm also naked. Uh, always helps. <laughs> um, Ladies. <laughs> Opening the video call. <laughs> I found that the n almost nihilism of the film, it just wasn't working for me this time. I don't know. I'll talk more about this later. But right now sure. I'm kind of on the fence. I could go either way at this point. I'll leave the floor open to you guys. Julia, do you recommend the movie? No. It's really harsh, actually, because it's not bad compared to the rest of his movies at all. I just found it a little, well, it was a little dull and quite a bit soulless as far as I was concerned. I am left empty. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, I'm That makes it less bit, harsh when you say that. <laughs> a bit dramatic. I don't know. I guess I was like jazzed. Yeah, which is a word that people use these days is jazzed. Uh, I was all like jazzed to watch it and I was just kind of like, oh. Oh, okay, we're done now. And there it goes, into the ether. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have, uh, like, a few points to make and different things and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But I'm actually, like, you know, womp womp. Mm -hmm. We can go into more detail on yeah. that, yeah. Yeah. Kevin, do you recommend the movie? It will absolutely depend on what you're expecting from it. Now, once again, I had seen this movie with the expectation that it was going to be Escape from L.A. And so it was better than that. Well, that's a subjective term because... Because Julia this is, loves Escape from L.A. <laughs> well, <laughs> we don't have to worry about stepping on each other's toes. <laughs> Escape from L.A. was a ridiculously fun movie that wasn't really all that intelligent. Escape from New York was less fun and more serious than Escape from L.A., but it depends on what your expectations are because it's absolutely no Assault on Precinct 13, and it's... Definitely not Prince of Darkness. So you have the two extremes there in terms of fun versus serious. I'd put Big Trouble in Little China in the, in the Prince of Darkness role. Okay, same extreme, different direction. Yeah. But you see my point there? Yes. It felt like it was trying too hard to be both and failing at both and falling somewhere in between. So if you're looking for something fun, it's fun. If you're looking for something a little bit more gritty, it's a little bit more gritty but don't have a whole lot of expectations for it. So if that's the kind of movie you want, I absolutely recommend Escape from New York. I'm like, I'm one of the only people here who's wholeheartedly recommending it. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I will say that, you know, I was wanting to see if he would build on Assault on Precinct 13 and what he did there. He didn't. It's pretty much just a throwback to that, but even then not as clean. The plot does kind of wander around a bit, and when the climax happens, it just kind of happens, not so much because they built there, but because it just happens. They even have a ticking clock, and yet a large chunk of that just keeps disappearing, so they don't even really play on that very often. I don't know. I liked the stoicism of Snake Plissken. I do think that he is a bit underdeveloped. I know that's by intention, and we'll, we'll talk about the cut opening scene that they trimmed out of the first act that they intentionally cut because they thought it was humanizing him too much. 
Mm -hmm. I think it could have used something more like that to give his journey some more weight. I like a lot of the biting satire of the piece, even though it's very underplayed and very quiet satire. I mean, this isn't Demolition Man. <laughs> where it's just going to like throw big horns and neon lights on all the satire, which isn't to criticize Demolition Man. I love that movie. The best movie. Yes. <laughs> it's the Robocop of the 90s. <laughs> I think, though, it's very atmospheric. It's very slow. It's very moody. I think the thing is we have our memories of Escape from L.A. where it's this big, crazy, post-apocalyptic, silly action movie. And the original isn't. It's not silly. It's got a biting satirical edge to it. Oh, it's plenty silly. Well, <laughs> but it plays it straight. That's what I mean. It plays it moodier. It plays it creepier. It plays it eerier. Mm -hmm. It does still have the silliness there, but it's not playing it as silly. It's playing it as odd and disquieting and unpleasant. For the most part, there are still some genuinely good humorous bits, but I can see why it's not clicking. I can see why, especially looking back on our memories around the time that, you know, Escape from L.A. came out, that colored so much of what our memory or what our expectations were for this. And this is not that. It's not even as exciting as Assault in Precinct 13. It doesn't really have that many action scenes. It's a lot of just kind of prowling around in shadows with these figures in the distance. It's a Western. It's a very spaced out, sparse Western with occasional bits of action, occasional winking bits of satire. And it is extremely nihilistic, where everyone is kind of a corrupt creep, and you aren't really rooting for anyone, and the only reason you're rooting for Snake is because he occasionally does the right thing. Occasionally. But I also like the supporting characters, like Cabby and Maggie and Brain and all that stuff, and the Duke was kind of fun, even though he didn't really do much. Borgnine was giving it 110%. Absolutely. Well, Borgnine is Borgnine, yeah. Hmm. And then you have anime Steve Buscemi there. Yeah, he was interesting. He also looks like the kid from the, the I Like Turtles meme. <laughs> That is the blonde gang leader from Assault on Precinct 13. Oh, yeah. The one who shoots the girl at the ice cream truck. <laughs> really? Because he did not age well. Well, a lot of that was makeup. Basically, he was just written as a generic role, and the actor just went off and did his own entire thing with it. Oh, he's doing great. Yeah. He's the one who did the hair. He's the one who kind of made them all gaunt and almost heroin. And he's still an actor who's still around today, does a ton of theater. Yeah. Are we talking about that Peter Pan guy? The Peter Pan guy. The Brad Dourif character. <laughs> the guy with that big thing of, like, Dragon Ball Z hair. Yeah. He looked like the ghost of Christmas past from Scrooge. <laughs> Especially when he got the cabbie hat. Yeah. yeah. I was alternating between calling him anime Steve Buscemi and anime Christopher Walken. <laughs> I could see that as well. Because he had that face. He reminds me of Brad Dourif in Dune. <laughs> he was kind of bringing in that energy. I was way more crass. Am I thinking of the right person? I think I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. I was just calling him fucked up Peter Pan. <laughs> <laughs> he is a little panish. <laughs> a little pan the man. He reminds me of this gesture character called Malone, but I'm probably the only one here who's seen Highlander, the animated series. I believe so. <laughs> it was just you and the guy who drew it. <laughs> oh, people really should watch it, though. It's awesome. So, but anyways, I'm surprised that it didn't work for you guys as much but I'm also understanding of it. Well, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I got the feeling multiple times that it wasn't entirely certain what it wanted to be, and so it wasn't really committing on any of it. And those slow fade to black and fade from black transitions were really, really bugging me. But aside from, I mean, it was enjoyable. I, um, ah. Uh... If we had watched this before we started doing Masters of Carpentry, I would have had a completely different reaction. I would have been like, yes, it's awesome. I love it. Snake Plissken, A number one. But I've been seeing this these films with a more critical eye and seeing John Carpenter's strengths and weaknesses. So I was noticing a lot more than I had before. I was just like, ah, Noel hit the nail on the head. It is Western. He's a Western hero. You can actually kind of chart the progression of action heroes. And this is kind of like a stopgap between like the Clint Eastwoods before of the strong, silent man with no name leading up to the Snake Pliskins and Maxes of the Mad Max franchise and then going into like your Cobras and whatnot of the big muscle men of the 80s. So it was fascinating in that regard. But the tone just didn't work for me this time. It felt very, like, too slight, but not in a good way. Like, Assault on Precinct 13 did so much with so little, and this had a lot more, but seemed to do less with it. Right. Again, I'm still in the fence. It's still... A very influential movie. The style is unbeatable. The soundtrack is amazing. Although I will say that when it first started, I'm like, oh, the soundtrack does not hold up for Snake's theme. 
But once you get past that kind of like action hero send up, which I guess must be satire, that da na na da na na. It was surprisingly almost like a sweet and gentle theme. Yeah, it's true. But when you get into like the Duke of New York's theme and whatnot, it's slamming. Well, and then you get into like the action scenes and you have like a cowbell and disco music. Yeah, no, that's great stuff. Great classic Carpenter stuff. I have nothing against that. I think you're absolutely right in that this was a film that was very much between generations. It was very much like the 70s grindhouse action movies, where it's that very kind of cheap, very sparse, and then also a bridge to the 80s action movie, Mm -hmm. which were just about to kick in and were very over the top and very almost comic booky. And this, it's almost too sparse and not comic booky enough. They hadn't found that middle point yet. It's true, and I could have a much different interpretation the next time I view it, but the way I was looking at it with, A, the eyes looking back to the past, back to my original relationship with the film, and through the eyes of Masters of Carpentry, which, even though this is a podcast between chums, it's really opened my eyes and made me see what I wanted in movies in a very different way, so... I'm at a weird crossroads here, guys. I'm, I've got a lot of emotions. <laughs> yeah, and it's also talking about the experience through Masters of Carpentry. We saw that period there where he did so much writing mm-hmm. and had become so tight and so honed as a writer. And yet, as we started to see with the fog, he's starting to slip on that. He's starting to focus more on the direction and not enough on building a script. There's a lot of style, but it doesn't have those quirks and right. beats that he has with some of his other films. Like, we don't yeah. get those characters. And we also don't really get what he's been really good at so far is right. that female voice as well. I mean, you have Maggie, but she's not enough of a presence in the movie. Yeah, which is fine. Like, she's a shell-shocked character who's trapped in this nightmare world, so you can't really expect too much quips from her. But it's really, like, that's all you get. Well, I almost wonder what would it have been like had Maggie been the woman that he met in the dying her and then she sticks with him until he reunites her with brain that would have been great yeah that would have been a stronger movie i would prefer if Mm. she had played the character of brain yeah good point yeah i mean what i did like though is that yes she is a woman who's been given to this guy by the leader but basically she's also the one who's in charge in that relationship oh yeah she's the muscle she's the one who's always ordering brain around and leading him around and like he can't even hold a gun so she grabs it from him and starts blowing people away it's an interesting character that plays an interesting dynamic on, on an old trope. Mm-hmm. But yeah, they don't do enough to develop her. Cabby is really only in like three scenes. That's true, he is. And then he just disappears, and then he comes back and he disappears. The Duke just kind of shows up, but you never really get to learn anything about him. This was written in 1974, so this was written before Assault on Precinct 13, even. Mm-hmm. And I think it shows a bit of that looseness, and then it doesn't show that tightening and that, that level of depth that he built throughout the later half of the 70s. So it is interesting looking at it with the eyes of, I, I expected this would be kind of like one of his big perfect moments where everything would come together. And it's not. It's actually, he's kind of starting to drop the ball on things. Mm-hmm. His direction, he's finding weird tones for scenes that don't quite play them to their best. His plot's not holding together as strong. He's not giving us that development to the characters. I mean, Kevin, as someone who hasn't been watching all of the John Carpenter movies like we have, what's your take on this? Like I said before, it felt like he was trying to do a bunch of different things and couldn't really commit on any of them. But as far as if this is going to be one of his weaker films, it was still a pretty good weaker film. Of course. I'll take this over the fog. Yeah, definitely. There were some really great bits, like how they never really talked about Snake's past. Everyone kept bringing it up and then not going into it because it really ultimately didn't matter. Right. You just get the name of a place and then suddenly it has this history to it. Yeah. There were other plot points. Like, I forgot halfway through the movie what that tape actually was. I still don't know what that was. I mean, I understood that it was important. They never fully explain that, Yeah. It was the secret to cold fusion technology because all of this war has been based around fuel sources, like oil wells and stuff like that. And with cold fusion technology, if you suddenly give the entire world cold fusion technology, the hope is that they'll stop fighting over resources. Okay. So that's what that is. That makes sense. (laughs) I like the idea that, like, the whole plot is now so null and void. Like, the thought of a hard copy tape having to be retrieved. And it's like, you can't get another (laughs) copy of the tape in this entire 24-hour process. It's like everything is just on a single tape. Who was the person who talked on the tape? (laughs) Especially when it's a tape that you are about to give to the world, so what does it matter if the contents of it leak or not? It's such a flimsy medium, too. It can be erased magnetically, it can be ripped up, the machine can eat it. (laughs) There really is no other copy. 
I get the build up to the punchline that he's going to swap it with one of Cabby's tapes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But yeah. yeah, it's still a very weird thing to hinge everything on. Am I wrong, though? Like, I assumed that that was going to happen as soon as they did the close up shot of the tapes in the cab. Yeah. I was like, okay, I get it. Even before that, when they had anime Steve Buscemi wearing Cabby's hat, and it was like, oh, I traded it for him. It was immediately like, oh, Cabby's got the tape. No, I mean way before that. Like yeah. when he got in the cab. The very oh. first scene when he got in the cab was There's a shot a of, the of the tape deck, deck and yeah. all of his tapes. Oh, then yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah. yeah, okay, I get it. I'm not as sharp as you, Julia, so I did not get <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, it's like, I remember this being like a really striking and shocking ending, but now I'm seeing how they're building to it. And it's like, you could have played with that. You could have built up that a little more. I still like the ending, but I don't entirely like the way that they built up to it. By him destroying that tape, does that not make the deal that he made with the guy null and void? Because he said, I need the tape. I don't give a shit if the president's dead. It's the tape that I need. So when he brought back the president and then destroyed the tape, I thought, yeah, he's going to do the joke. But if he destroys the tape, doesn't that mean that now he just has to go back? To my memory, we learned that that did bite him in the ass in Escape from L.A. So he's basically on the run again. Mm Mm-hmm. Seems like he could have saved himself a lot of problems just by giving the tape. I I know it's an awesome, like, fuck you ending, but... Because uh, in the end, isn't he screwing over the whole world? (laughs) Yeah, by, like, taking away cold fusion. That he could live in. That he does live in. (laughs) Which would be, like, nice new fuels for banks for him to rob. Like, it works in his best interest. (laughs) It's that Guardians of the Galaxy line. Why should we save the world? Because we live in it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) I get the moment, and I kind of like the big fuckiness of it. But yeah, it's, again, he did not build to it properly, and it's... It's it's just him being petulant, almost. See, and, that, and that's the thing is, I hate to feel down on this film, because it is a good action movie, it's a good movie, but yeah, in the wake of what we've been through with Carpenter... Yeah. It's like the fog. It's like he's trying to live up to expectations, but he's not fixing the right things, and he's not developing the yeah. right things. I feel like I disappoint Carpenter fans when I say things about these. I know this film's legacy is secure. It's just approaching it from just a slight altering of my viewpoint, and I'm seeing things I never saw before. Right. No, is this his biggest budget picture so far, or is it not? It is so far. Yeah. I mean, we still have The Thing and Big Trouble in Little China, Starman and Memoirs of Invisible Man are actual studio big budget films. But this is his first, like, big push, yeah. Well, I mean, it's only six million. It's still a very low budget movie. Yeah. But for 1981, though, six million is not so bad. Well, because I just wonder, because with money comes opinions. Mm. Like, you know, when I have a whole bunch of different opinions on your vision, a lot of times it can get a lot of holes punched in it Mm. that normally kept it together. I don't think that's a problem he had here. It seemed like he pretty much got free reign because he brought it in low. He already was on a commitment from the studio. I think, honestly, Elvis probably cost more. Wow. Because Elvis was a big budget miniseries. And twice as long. <laughs> and also had a much more sprawling cast and bigger locations. But you said, no, they made some changes afterwards. They cut a scene? Yeah, there was an opening scene. It's the bank robbery where Snake got arrested, mm-hmm. where he basically steals an entire cache of credit cards, hops on a train that, that like in an hour gets him out to San Francisco, and it's him and his old war buddy. And just as they're getting off the train, the cops swoop in and just shoot the hell out of the war buddy. Snake has this moment where he starts to run away, but then it's like his buddy's still dying there and he comes back and he's like, he drops his bag and he's like, drop the bag. They won't keep shooting you. And then they just keep shooting him. It's like him losing his last tie to humanity, his best friend. And that's why he's so pissed off. And it does humanize him a lot. And there's a lot of really good acting there by Kurt Russell. I understand why they cut it, but I almost wish they had left it in because it was a good scene. And it, it actually would give more emotional weight to Snake throughout the film in terms of he's just literally had this entire government just blow away his best friend, mm-hmm. throw him in jail, and is now asking him to work for them again. It would have changed the entire tone of the movie. I understand why they did it, because they wanted it to be leaner and meaner and more nihilistic, but I don't relate to it as much because of that. Mm -hmm. And again, I prove that they did that. Like, I think they made the right call by making it because then maybe the balance would have been off in a wrong way. Like they would have had that human element, but it wouldn't have been as strong of a film. But again, like you say, it's hard to relate to Snake. Missed opportunities. And it's literally just it's the first reel of the movie. So they just chopped off the first reel. So it's not like it would affect the editing or pace at all because it's just like a six minute sequence Mm -hmm. plus credits that you're just putting right at the very beginning of the movie. And then everything else plays out exactly the same. I would love to just sit down and watch a cut. I actually probably could just make a cut of it myself and just watch a cut with that just to see how it fits in context. But yeah, it just, that was what made Assault on Precinct 13 work so well. You had those human moments. 
I mean, this one still has a few moments. Like, there's that great bit where Snake is walking around the wreckage of the plane, and he just pulls out a chair, and he just sits down. He's looking at the watch, and he's just taking in the fact that he might not be alive come morning. Mm -hmm. It's all come down to this. It's all come down to him being screwed over into working for a system that just took everything from him. And I think without that opening scene, you don't get that context to give that scene the weight that it needs. Then I also like that you have this entire build to the end where the reason why he screws the president over is not just to screw him over, but because he literally asked the president, people just lost lives to save you. Does that mean anything to you? Mm -hmm. And the president's like, I got to get on air. <sighs> what do you want? It could have been action cinema's cool hand, Luke. And, you know, that was the moment where he was sitting there with the tape. And if the president gave the right answer, he would have given him the real tape. But it doesn't matter what the president says. The president doesn't matter. It's the tape that matters. I know. Yeah. They kind of prove that no one matters in this. <laughs> Again, I understand the dramatic point, the dramatic device of that moment. Mm -hmm. But the tape as a MacGuffin, it just doesn't quite make sense the minute you think. It's like Michael Myers. It's like really cool. But then you stop and think about it for a second. Mm -hmm. I notice John Carpenter falling prey to that. And I think that's something that is going to start to plague his career more and more. Now that I think about it are, I'm going to do something because it's kind of cool. Yeah. And he stops thinking about why it may, I mean, like Assault and Precinct 13 works because it actually makes a lot of sense and is well thought out. Mm -hmm. you know, same with Someone's Watching Me was as meticulously crafted of a thriller as you can get. It had a point of view. And he's turning to lose interest in that. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is what kind of is hurting me as someone going through Carpenter. I think we've got some great ones coming up, though. But I mean, I'm I'm hesitant to like go back into Starman and They Live and Prince right. of Darkness. And even in The Mouth of Madness, as much as I've loved In the Mouth of Madness in the past, I haven't seen it in about 10 years. And I'm That's going to be like, an interesting one to revisit for me. I'm a little worried about what it's going to be like with this context. Mm hmm. I'm excited to look at the thing with these fresh new Masters of Carpentry eyes, right. but I'm pretty confident it's going to hold up. Yeah, I mean, that's one of those films I watch like every two years, so it's not like it's been a long time since I've seen it. Same here. So much in this film is good. Mm -hmm. The cinematography is really good. The set decoration is really good. The cast mm -hmm. is really good. The music is, I actually mostly like it. And it's also not a bad vision of the future. It's just the way that it's all put together. It just yeah. isn't as tight as it could be. It's just no. not as well thought out as it could be. The premise is great, and the vision of the future is awesome. Just that they have these prison islands and stuff, as far-fetched as it is, it's very, like... It's just a great what-if scenario. Yeah, exactly. Well, I'm actually going to go ahead and say that I've never really been a fan of the big mega prison where the people are left to themselves with little to no supervision and just, you know, toss food in for a while and the whole hierarchy thing. That's never really been anything that just appealed to me personally. I mean, I played Arkham City a little while ago, and while that was a bigger story and a bigger scope and had a lot more of great moments than the first game, Arkham Asylum, it just didn't resonate with me specifically for that same reason. The reason why I thought it kind of worked here, mm -hmm. and I agree with you, it usually comes off feeling kind of forced and, and cartoony. The reason why I thought it was okay here was they treated it like it was an old Western outlaw town, where it does have a social hierarchy. You basically just don't go out at night because that's when the crazies run around. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, there is still a system there. It's a very rundown, very Old West-style system with steam-powered cars. Again, it's such a sparse film. Mm -hmm. But I think that also serves to its benefit in that they're not going too over the top. Right. Did they explain why they chose Manhattan? I think just for location, because they wanted to have that immediate visual that you'd recognize as New York with like the yeah. Statue of Liberty and the Twin mm -hmm. Towers and stuff like that. There's that, and it's already segregated because all you have to do is blow up the bridges. It just yeah. doesn't make any sense. Like, Manhattan Island is filled with things that tourists yeah. want to see and rich people. <laughs> well, they never explain it, but there was some kind of cataclysm that I think was tied to the war. So, like, it was already destroyed or something? Maybe, like, an earthquake hit it or something. Yeah, there. I know that there was some kind of cataclysm that did something to New York that caused it to basically be ruined and abandoned. So then they decided, let's just turn it into a penal colony. I think also part of it was playing on the ideas the fears that Manhattan would continue to ghettoize. Mm. So you're basically just cutting that off anyways and then just dropping people into it. I mean, you'll notice that they say that in 1988, crime suddenly expanded 400 times. Why? Because that would have been the end of Reagan's term. 
Oh. So I don't know entirely what they're saying there. I don't either. <laughs> like, why specifically 1988, which just so happens to coincide with the end of the term of the president who was just voted into office before this movie was made? I, mean, I honestly don't know what Carpenter's politics are, so I don't know if there was a point to that. Yeah, I don't mean either. But it's interesting, and he said that he was building off of Death Wish, even though he really didn't agree with the views of Death Wish. But I think it's then playing off the idea that, you know, it's become rubbled, it's become increasingly ghettoized, and instead of using support and rebuilding it, because also the nation is entirely, you know, distracted by this massive war, the Cold War just keeps escalating. So they just basically make a place that they can just toss people and just forget about them. Mm -hmm. I say, boy, you just, you just throw all the criminals over <laughs> where all the high crime is at and let them just make the crime because, you know, that's where all the crime is. <laughs> It doesn't hold together. I think that's the thing is it's a premise that it's so much of it is just very suggestive mm -hmm. and it suggests a lot. But again, when you really think about it and try to piece it together, it doesn't really all add up, which again, I don't entirely mind because he's mostly playing with allegory and he's mostly just playing it loose just for, I need this because that's the story that I'm telling. Yeah. You don't want to think about it because if you think about it, like right. what kind of a society is doing this where they're making like yeah. this part of the city, a uh, no man's land and just throwing everyone in there. I mean, he's doing allegorical sci-fi instead of hard sci-fi. Mm -hmm. But again, what is it saying? I don't really get what the movie is even trying to say about it. Well, yeah. there's also the fact that the Manhattan skyline, especially at that point in time, was one of the most recognizable skylines right. in the world. And so you just had the shock factor. I mean, the World Trade Center is incorporated into the plot as the landing point of his glider. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's like just the shock factor of, hey, the world is so crappy that New York, this wonderful, everybody knows New York. Well, that's the crap hole. Mm -hmm. So it may not even be any more allegorical than, hey, that's a quick, recognizable right. gut shot. Right. And again, this was written right around the same time as Salt and Precinct Theatre, where they basically just want to do urban westerns. Mm -hmm. And this is a perfect loose sci-fi setting for an urban western. It wasn't that shocking to me as a kid, though, because right. I'm a Canadian and through American cinema, I thought everything was garbage cans on fire and steamy grates and everything's yeah. horrible. <laughs> and everything in America is Vancouver anyway. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is there was so much 80s cinema that this was very much the turning point of like the 70s cinema ending in the 80s and the beginning and this and the original Mad Max are like right in the middle there. Yeah. Most of this film was actually shot in St. Louis. Interesting. Only a few bits were shot in New York, like especially when they're at the base of Statue of Liberty. Most of it was shot in St. Louis because St. Louis was itself a largely abandoned wreck at the time. Okay, makes sense. But it was still an active population center, so they would literally, every night, they would have to go in, throw up all of their set decor, basically have, like, wallpapered graffiti, mm -hmm. and shoot as much as they can, and then come four in the morning, they'd have to take everything off and clean up the streets for the day's traffic. Yikes. And that included the plane. That would have been tough. They bought an actual full plane for, like, $800,000. <laughs> It was a wrecked plane, so it was no longer active, and they literally just chopped it in three pieces, and they would just go in the middle of St. Louis, set up this plane wreck, and then they'd have to clean it off the street and then bring it back for the next night shooting. But there were some people who actually started calling in 911 reports that there's a crashed plane that's down in the street. <laughs> so yes, this was actively in St. Louis, and then there was some interior shot in L.A. In fact, Brain's home is the library at USC, and that was like USC let him do it as their with everything that went on with Dark Star, let's just clear the air and say, move on. And so it was... Uh, St. Louis looks messed up, and they messed it up even further. And it was interesting that they brought in Joe Adults, who was like an A-list production designer, who had just done Jaws and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and is suddenly doing a cheap little $6 million John Carpenter movie. It does look great, though. It does look great. And Alves, he's actually got a commentary track, too. He really loved working on it. Oh, nice. Although, according to the poster, the Statue of Liberty is in Manhattan <laughs> because the head is right there. Yeah. Well, abstract, yeah. <laughs> well, it's a big sci-fi stinger history thing that you have to use the Statue of Liberty to right. show that the world's messed up. You fools. <laughs> <laughs> All the way up to, like, Cloverfield and the day after tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you see, that's because this takes place after Cloverfield, where the Cloverfield monster pushed the statue into the city. Oh, okay. It all comes together. <laughs> and then all those buildings basically become the sand that's the beach that then buries the Statue of Liberty that's then uncovered in Planet of the Apes. I understand. 
I'm just now I'm just came up with an idea. Do a science fiction novel chronicling what all happens to the Statue of Liberty as each of these eras passes it by. That would be amazing. <laughs> Starting with like Escape from New York and going all the way to like Star Trek. How they get their act together and <laughs> And ending it with like a Star Blazers parody where they just turn it into a spaceship and just take off. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, I thought Kurt Russell was really good, but again, it's, there's just not much there. It is a very iconic look to the role. Very much so. Very iconic look. And the eye patch was his idea. Okay. The camo or snakeskin tights don't really age well. They were camo tights. That's part of his old soldier uniform. Yeah. And then, yeah, then the random shin guards. I mean, it's come back around to the point where he just looks like a member of the Strokes, but uh, <laughs> for a while it was a bit dated. Yeah. I mean, it. I don't really have much to say about him because they don't really give him that much to do. I mean, it's an interesting journey. It's an interesting kind of fuck you anti-hero. Yeah. But how much does he really get to do? Visually, he's so striking. But again, yeah, as you say, he basically just growls and grimaces. He's basically the man with no name. Right. And it was because of Lee Van Cleef that he had the idea of just playing it like Clint. And it's like, I would rather just kind of see what you'd do without just doing a Clint impersonation. Yeah, a few quips wouldn't have been remiss, but we still have two characters coming up who are going to be amazing. So I thought all the background people were doing even a much better job. I like the Peter Pan guy, Romero, I think. Uh, anime uh, I Steve like... Buscemi. Yeah, Anime Steve Buscemi was great. Uh, Cabby was great. I always like seeing Adrian Barbeau. What's nice about Harry Dean Stanton is he usually plays this kind of mumbly and sloshy kind of weird haggard loser of a guy. Mm-hmm. Here, he's playing this very erudite intellectual, which you don't usually hear him deliver dialogue, very precise type of speaking very often. Right, yes. I like that. I thought Isaac Hayes did a bang-up job. Like, you don't really see him too much, and he doesn't yeah. have much to do, but he looks like a Duke of New York. <laughs> like, that guy's in charge. I like the scene where they've got the president tied up to the wall and they're just shooting at him just because hey i've got a gun it's the first time i've had a gun in who knows how many years i'm just gonna shoot at the president it's true <laughs> while teaching him to like have a saying of like what is it you're the duke of new york or a number one or something like that yeah that's exactly what it is and then donald pleasance is the president who always does a solid job donald pleasance has never turned in a bum performance i love though that he didn't cover his british accent and john carpenter was talking about on the commentary that he actually wrote up an essay backstory about because of margaret thatcher they ended up with a british president <laughs> <laughs> I buy it. And it was all supposed to be this commentary on that. Carver's like, I'm not going to use that in the film, but if you want to run with it, go for it. <laughs> I mean, I love that there's that one scene where they come and he's just wearing a blonde wig for no reason, which was apparently Donald Pleasance's idea. Oh, really? It was a great wig. That's a great looking wig. I've yeah. paid who knows how much to have something look like it's been attacked by a cat when it came out of the bag. <laughs> that thing was perfectly brushed in this crazy jail society. Someone had been looking after that. Only the best for the president. Mm-hmm. See, and I like how at the end of the movie, he still sticks with Snake and basically saves the day. But yeah. The president grabs the machine gun and saves the day. It's true. People do do the right thing sometimes. But how much was it him protecting Snake and how much was it him just getting back? at the duke it's true yeah but he still dropped the line so snake could climb up Mm -hmm. and he's like thank you whatever you want you got it now i gotta get on tv go away why did he stop pulling him up halfway up to bait him i think i think he wanted to draw the duke out and then shoot him yeah oh because he. i think that's why they focused up on his hand and made it clear that he was stopping him so that when the duke comes out to finish him off he's gonna gun him down oh right right and what's funny about lee van cleef in this movie is he looks exactly like what john carpenter looks like now that is i would confusing to me i'm like is this the john carpenter cameo that's a lot of cameo (laughs) because that's what john carpenter's basically looked like for the last 20 years yeah mustache guy with ponytail in the back (laughs) yeah at first i was like why does this general have an earring i have met a lot of uh high brass military guys and that's just lee van cleef's earring he wanted to leave it in yeah fair enough (laughs) do what you want (laughs) and then season hubley who was the girl that you met in the diner that was kurt russell's wife who played priscilla and elvis nice Season oh, I Hubbly. had a question. Yeah. Sorry, I had a question about the diner scene. Go ahead. How did the crazies come up through the floor? Uh, because they were in in the underground. Underground what? The sewers. They live in the sewers, and they basically dig their own tunnels throughout the sewers. They explained that when they were when. So they were in a sewer underneath the building. They may have tunneled under the building. Could have been in the basement. There are a lot too. of, especially since if it was shot in St. Louis, a lot of St. Louis is actually built on top of St. Louis. Oh. Seattle's the same way. Oh, that's because they had the fire, didn't they? Yeah. So there's actually an entire city that got forgotten and built over, and I think New York has some of that at, at some point. Well, I think what they were doing here is they either just came up through the ground 
or are they just tunneled into the basement? Yeah. And we're just coming up to the basement. Stores have basements there, too, especially in the cities where there's a city underneath, where the city yeah. basement's connected to the sewers, because the sewers used to be the streets. I think the mm-hmm. big thing is supposed to be the crazies are all underground, except during the night when they come out to feed. And then I think she even had the line that they've run out of food for the month. I see. Because what they do, the military will just, like, drop in packets of food every month, apparently. Gross. <laughs> Because that was the whole thing where the helicopter came down at the food drop-off point. Yeah. So the crazies are so enraged with hunger that instead of coming through the sewer grates or open areas, they're just bursting through floorboards and yeah. grabbing whatever they can, including live women. <laughs> Long story short, it's scarier. <laughs> they did have that establishing bit where his foot went through the floorboard to establish that it's rotting out. Mm-hmm. But I think, yeah, and then there are multiple lines where they refer to the crazies as cannibals of like, you know, the president's dead. Someone served him for dinner. They should have had a separate island. That's just my two cents. <laughs> I think it's just that he's going for a Romero Night of the Living Dead vibe, but he knows the shorthand, so you don't need to show like cannibalism or anything like that. We know they're cannibals. We know they're trying to eat everyone. I got a lot of anxiety watching that scene just because it reminded me of Resident Evil. And I'm like, oh, man, he's going to get caught in a corner. (laughs) (laughs) It's an interesting scene. But again, where does it go? Where does that lead? It's just another action scene for the sake of an action scene. It's kind of like he's a tourist for a bit. Like, it's very much a Western thing where he goes to the saloon, sees scenes of intense inhumanity, kind of doesn't do anything, and then goes and sees, like, the next vignette of what a horror show version of society would be in these sort of conditions. And then there was also another scene that they cut where a lot of the gangs were supposed to be divided along ethnic lines, which I'm kind of glad they didn't stick with that. Yeah. There's that scene where they go up onto the roof to get the glider, but this entire gang is tearing it apart. Mm -hmm. And Brain yells, damn Redskins. Oh, uh, did he say that in this version or he was did. he supposed to? It's okay. still a line there, but it's like while there's gunfire going on. And there was supposed to be a tribe of Native Americans that lived in the base of the World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. And then that was supposed to be the first action scene that Snake had when he got down to the ground floor was they were all huddled around a fire and they got a new big fight with them. And I'm kind of glad they cut that beat out and just kind of yeah. let it hang out. And also, uh, Carpenter kind of, I think, regretted that they were going to go along that line initially. Right, right. And once you got the Duke, you see his gang is a little more assault on Precinct 13. It's a little more integrated. Right. Yeah, exactly. It became less about that and more about you have the Duke's gang, you have the crazies, and then you have the people on Broadway who are just pure anarchists. There's people just trying to get by, like Brain and... Um... Brain and Cabby. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's yeah. I don't, again, I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> you in the movie. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah, no, and again, you know, as great as that scene with the woman in the diner was, there was no real point to it other than just a nihilistic hellscape type sequence. Yeah, I was just kind of seeing like this is the show that anything could happen to anyone. Right. This is the show that this could be led, but it doesn't right. really matter to the character. Where I think it still would have been, I, I actually like that idea of no, you introduce Maggie there, then she sticks with him, and we get to develop that partnership more, mm-hmm. and then you have that bit where she then dies on the bridge, saving his life. I think that would have had more impact. And even then, the the way that they shot her death on the bridge, they ended up having to go in and insert some extra shots that they shot in John Carpenter's driveway because they realized they didn't clearly show that she had died. I said that he had to rewind it. Alex had to rewind it and play it again because right. it was shot so weird that I was like, I don't understand what's happening. How? Why is she covered in blood? What's going on? <laughs> exactly. And then that shot of her covered with blood was just literally a pickup shot that they did in Carpenter's driveway because they realized that they forgot to put something in there. Again, Maggie seems like a really interesting character, but she doesn't get enough time to really develop into a Lee. No, exactly. She has the potential there, and I like the way Adrian plays her, but yeah, you don't really get that her and Brain's relationship. You don't really get to develop enough. They really literally do stand on the sidelines for most of the movie. Cabby just literally keeps coming and going and doesn't really do anything. He's just there whenever they need a car. Yeah. It's just not as well constructed of a plot as I'd like. And I I read this, and it was a really great script to read, Mm -hmm. but it's like, even then, it doesn't like pull you in and like grip you from beginning to end. There were too many bits where I'm just sitting here going like, you know what? You could have connected that thread to that thread. There's something more you could have done here. You're just, this is an obvious plot device. It doesn't get past bare criticism. It has one of my big story no-nos where it has a gladiator scene. Those are always (laughs) very tedious to me. And that's the thing. I like the scene, but again, it's just everybody suddenly runs away and Snake doesn't even have to escape. He's just like, well, no one's looking anymore. Okay. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Works out for me. It's like the Duke makes this big thing of having this prisoner in Snake Plissken, and then it's just like, oh, no, let's just ignore him. Let him run away. Because nothing means anything in Manhattan. (laughs) I mean, I like the fight, and I like Ox Baker, who was a big professional wrestler in the 80s. Yeah. 
and sadly has passed away recently. But yeah, he was this massive six foot eight dude. He looks like Zangief from Street Fighter. Yes. And that's his actual beard and eyebrows. Oh, they're incredible. <laughs> I was wondering where they were getting the razors from for all these artisanal beards. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of cool things where people just happen to find, like, 3D glasses and stuff like that. It's very 80s punk, which I do love. And then Romero, his teeth are all filed down to points, too, so he has oh, that they? aspect, too. Yeah. There's a lot of flair with these gangsters. <laughs> I guess they've got the time. That's true. This, like, set the bar that a lot of other films would build off of, even though it doesn't play it as big and wild as a lot of those later films will. I would imagine that a lot of 80s gangs got their look from this movie. They must have, where it's just sort of like a neon, kind of like sort of new wave punk. Yeah. I would argue the Warriors. The Warriors, definitely, yeah. yeah. this is a post-Warriors movie. This, that yeah. was late 70s. I could see that. The Warriors had a lot of variety. <laughs> the Warriors didn't really go too crazy in terms of the costumes, though, because, you know, the main Warriors were just wearing leather vests. and With the exception of the baseball Furies, You had the course. baseball guys, but otherwise everyone was pretty much just dressed in standard gang outfit. That's true. This was what started to amp that up and make it a little crazier and crazier. I know the Death mm -hmm. Wish film started to build on that, too. And then Road Warrior happened. Yeah. Road Warrior, even though it was a very different type of film, very much set the bar in terms of, you know, the mohawk, the bondage leather and all that stuff, the spike studs. Here's a question. When was The Lost Boys? Lost Boys wasn't until, like, late 80s. Okay, so that wouldn't have been an influence. Okay, never mind. Mm. And then there was also a film called Streets of Fire. I've heard tell of this movie, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, Streets of Fire, which, again, was another one of those ones where every person who made an anime in Japan saw Streets of Fire, and you can see that in every anime in Japan afterwards. Nice. But Streets of Fire was 84, and that was also Walter Hill, the guy who did Warriors, so it was just kind of building on what he did there. Okay. I don't really know that I have much else to say about this film. It didn't really wow. I mean, I enjoy the movie. I recommend the movie. I do think it is a very strong action movie for the period, but it's not as strong as it could be. It's not as strong as we've seen Carpenter do other films. It's incredibly iconic, mm -hmm. but there's not much beneath that iconic aspect. I'm going recommend as well. It does what it does well. It's just like, it's got a great legacy <laughs> and uh, it doesn't hold up for me in certain regards. And I can see how it set that way. I mean, it's like Halloween. Yeah. We've pulled apart and had some problems with, but we can see why it had the influence it had. And I still recommend Halloween very much so. It's very evocative without evoking anything in particular. Good point. Yeah. It is, exactly. Absolutely. You kind of fill in your blanks, which I find a lot of the movies that you grew up with in the 80s and 90s, it lets you fill in the blanks and had a lot of breathing room in terms of what you brought into it as well. Like, it doesn't tell you everything like the movies of today, where it's just 300 minutes of backstory followed right. by, like, you know, prequels and everything. I like how it's in the 80s and it basically set the tone that a lot of 80s action cinema would build off of. So you can see that influence. Yes, its tone is very like boilerplate. This is the standard right. to which you must fall. No one else can do right. this. It has to be this one man. He's the perfect guy for the job. He has no other choice. He's going to get the job done. A flamboyant villain. And the stakes have never been higher. It's like the anti Die Hard. Yeah, it is exactly. very much an anti-Die Hard, yeah. Well, Die Hard was like the end of the 80s and the transition into the 90s. It was the transition into the 90s snark action movie. Yes, and bringing character into action movie yeah. as well, where the guy can have a character other than I need to get right. my wife slash daughter slash whatever back. And then Escape from New York was also so early in the 80s that it itself was not influenced by any of the 80s wave that came after it. It's more 70s Death Wish, Dirty yeah. Harry, that type of thing. I could see the transition. It's very much that kind of 70s. And again, with a nihilistic atmosphere as well, that's very 70s. It's like there's this band that I love called The Sweet, where they exist right on this bubble between 70s glam rock and 80s hair metal. Nice. And it's like you can hear all of the influence of glam rock and see all of the influence that would lead to hair metal. And yet they're still hanging on this weird angle where they're not quite succeeding at either one. Mm -hmm. This one, it's not quite succeeding at 70s nihilistic gangster urban warfare movie, and it's also not quite succeeding as a big 80s action movie, and yet you can see where it fits right in the transition between the two. We're getting really good at this. I'd like to... <laughs> I like to derail us for a second. We're getting good at this reviewing movies thing. <laughs> Not to toot our own horn or anything, but yeah, that's where Big I think deep. watching things chronologically really helps because it helps you build a timeline and stuff like that. Yeah, it gives you a very much a perspective. And again, it feels like the fog in that he wanted to recapture past glory, and yet he's not focusing on the right aspects that would fully let him do that. Mm -hmm. Which again is to not say it's a bad movie. It's not. Mm -hmm. It's just you can see Carpenter starting to run up against the wall of his limitations. He's starting to get too loose in things that used to be really tight for him. 
He's losing his focus. But you said yourself it was an older script, so maybe it's that old Bronco Billy guy coming out with his, like, westerns are like this. Yeah. It could be. But again, remember, this was right around the same time Assault on Precinct 13 was written. Yeah, that's you true. Know? And that was still an incredibly tight movie. Mm-hmm. I want to see all of these people, especially Kurt Russell with a hurt leg, walk up and down 50 flights of stairs in the World Trade Center. And that's just it. There's the elevator that they put that takes him for most of the floors. That was not in the script. The script just actually had you expect that he was going up and down stairs. Yeah. So we're just going to need an hour 45. <laughs> <laughs> just cut that right off the top. Yeah. <laughs> of uh, you endlessly walking downstairs. Yeah. And I like how they like half-ass it. Like they get to the bottom and they're like, whoo. <laughs> <laughs> I built up a sweat. <laughs> I love how they just decided, oh, fuck it. We just, just throw an elevator on the roof. We'll just say that carried him most of the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> then just go another 50 flights. Now, yeah. I'd like to see a scene where they take out the engine of the car giggling because they're going to climb in <laughs> and then pop out when they open up the uh, hood of the car. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I love is then the Duke is just sitting on the engine that they just pulled out of the yeah. car. <laughs> <laughs> But no, Julia, we were talking in a past episode about how you were hoping that we would get to this point where Carpenter would take his ability to build characters and build story and build dialogue and merge that into the action movie. And I was hoping we would get that here, and we did. Honestly, I think it is a little juvenile. It's honestly, it's not there in character. It actually feels even like a step back from Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah, mm. like, I know what he's capable of, and I think that's not that I'm like, oh, I'm so disappointed. It's mm. I'm just kind of like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, not every yeah. school play is going to be a hit, you know? No. Like, but you go anyways, because it's your kid. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm noticing this with Carpenter of, like, we're seeing these things where, on its own, I would enjoy this movie a lot. But seeing it in the context of that broader career. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, we kind of ran into this with Halloween. I mean, I think Elvis, I probably wouldn't have hated as much as I did had I not seen it in the middle of everything. It's interesting that you usually think that, you know, looking at the broader context of a career would actually help things, would actually give you a deeper appreciation for it. And it's actually shedding more light on the, my belief that I think Carpenter peaked in the 70s. Hmm. And with the exception of The Thing. Right. We'll get to that in two episodes. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to jump on it too much, but by my memory, that is probably, for my money, one of his best movies, if not his best movie. And yet, the 70s, though, of mm -hmm. Carpenter was just this rich period of him doing so much different stuff and excelling at it. I like how everyone is pretty much in agreement that Assault on Precinct 13 here is the top of the top, because we all keep referring to it as such. We aren't bringing it up because you haven't seen it, but you need to see someone's watching it. Yeah, those two are the top of the top, yeah. Assault on Precinct 13 and someone's watching me. See, I would have said Assault on Precinct 13 at Halloween, but then I saw someone's watching me, and it's like, those two are just class act productions all the way through. I feel like Carpenter's an athlete, and we're his coaches, and we're learning what his strengths and weaknesses are, so when we don't see him performing to the level we know he's capable of, we're now kind of like... Oh. <laughs> Our first third of this entire project has just been all these surprises. Like, none of us had seen someone's watching me. None of us even knew about Zuma Beach or Better Late no, Than Never, you know? No. And you know, even Halloween, even though we really picked it apart, we still really liked it, mm -hmm. except for Julia. But there was so many surprises and so much variety. And as we're moving into the 80s, we're losing that. A, we're losing surprise because me and Alex have seen most of what's done in the 80s. Yeah. But we're also seeing it's a very narrower focus. You got the action movies, you got the horror movies, and he's not really doing anything else in between. And the quality is taking a dip. And Carpenter, what I loved was how strong of a writer he was. He's not maintaining that. This was not the conversation I expected to have with this. <laughs> I thought it was going to be half an hour of, uh, yeah. But I knew something was happening, like the way I was viewing it. I was just like, oh, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm having thoughts about this. My only thoughts that I had coming in were, you know, I really enjoyed this movie, just not as much as I thought I would. <laughs> From the moment you said that you heartily recommend this movie, and then you started listing off the things that you didn't like about it, I knew that this was going to be an interesting conversation. Because you went off like all gung-ho, you know, I'm going to completely yeah. disagree with you guys, I love, I I'm going to absolutely recommend this movie. Except for this part and this part and this part and this part and this part. <laughs> and the thing is, I still recommend the movie. I still absolutely recommend the movie. <laughs> Not with those, you know, except for this. I think it's still a good movie. Well, yeah. that's what I was thinking. Like, I was going through it and, like, I mentioned Cobra, and I'm like, I wholeheartedly love Cobra. And I'm like, I can't recommend Cobra and not this, because this Cobra's is actually a, a movie, better dude. movie than Cobra. <laughs> Cobra's a terrible movie. I like it for the wrong reasons. 
No, what I would be interested in, if you would be able to look into it for the next time that we record for the next movie, mm -hmm. what's going on in Carpenter's life as these movies are going on, as far as, like, personal relationships? Has he become a father at any point? Has he had marriages that didn't work out? I'd be interested to see those sort of, like, big life happenings, how they affect the different movies. And that's actually something I've been looking at, too, is as we're moving on into the next few films, I mean, a lot of the... I had a very big list of crew members who returned from past movies and were going on to other ones. A lot of this crew is going to be sticking with him for especially Halloween's 2 and 3. A bunch of them are still going to be in the thing. But then as you get into, like, Christine, They Live in Prince Darkness, you're starting to see a dwindling of people he had worked with before. I mean, Dean Cundy, the guy who shot this movie and shot Halloween and is going to shoot the next few suddenly became an A-list cinematographer and was going off and doing like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, Back to the Future, a bunch of Spielberg movies, eventually did Jurassic Park, and like became like one of the top cinematographers in the field, and he just didn't work with Carpenter anymore. So how is that going to affect the way his films are shot? You know, how is him having the support structure of this crew that he's used to falling away? How is that going to hurt him? And yeah, in terms of personal relationships, I know him and Adrian Barbeau are still really close friends, but yeah, their marriage falls apart. Him and Deborah Hill who have been producing partners for a while now, she's suddenly going to go off and do films without him and their team. I think that was actually the biggest loss for him was losing that stable producer who was always there and helped him get the right material at the right time with the right people. And suddenly she's off doing other things. And Carpenter really does, he built like this family around him, this community, and then that community goes away. And we're just like in the next few films, we're going to be seeing the last few bits of that community. I'm really bummed out now. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's the part of the story of Carpenter. And I don't even know how much that's him driving them away, as a lot of them went away because they got excellent opportunities elsewhere. Mm -hmm. I mean, like Nick Castle, who co-wrote this film and did all this other stuff, will suddenly go off and become a director of, in his own right. And, you know, Tommy Lee Wallace, who worked with him on another uh, a whole bunch of films, suddenly goes off and builds a career in his own right. Deborah Hill didn't leave because she stopped working with him, but she's got a whole bunch of opportunities working with other directors, too. Everyone kind of drifted away and made their own thing. And sadly, none of them ever really pulled back as their career started to dwindle of like try to go back and recapture those old days, which I'm now picturing like an Expendables type movie where like a whole bunch of 70s filmmakers try to get back together 30 years later and make an ultimate movie <laughs> after they've all gone off and had these big separate careers trying to get together and make another movie again. We need to make that and it needs to be directed by John Carpenter. John, are you listening? <laughs> we know you're listening, not are you? Yeah, listening? exactly. We know we you hope are. we hope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's just like, these guys have been poking apart my films. <laughs> See, I, I knew we were going to have this conversation with The Fog, but I didn't know we were going to have this conversation with Escape from New York in terms of he's already starting to fumble. There's a lot of twists in this podcast. Yeah. And it's like, again, I wouldn't really be having these issues if I was just watching the film on its own, but I'm watching it now and I'm like, John, this is a fun, iconic movie, but it could be so much better. Yeah. <laughs> what are you doing? Stop. Go back. And it's like, he sat on this script for like five years and he didn't continue to develop it anymore? Yeah, I really should have, um... One more pass. Yeah. Yeah. A little punch up. Yeah, a little punch up. I mean, I know Nick Castle was already off doing other things, so I can't really say Nick Castle continued as a co-writer on the film. They wrote the original 74 draft, the final draft was just Carpenter. So it's like, I don't really know what to say. It's just mm -hmm. Carpenter, I think, was starting to drop the ball. Right. He was starting to slacken off on the writing. He was starting to focus too much on just what's cool and what's neat instead of building characters. Mm -hmm. I mean, his characters were what made those 70 films so great. So anyways, any final thoughts that we want to have about it, Escape from New York? I don't want to say that it's a bad movie and that people shouldn't go watch it. No, absolutely not. No, we're just approaching this from a more thoughtful yeah. thing. It's just hard to reconcile that with someone who basically, if you had asked me a month prior, I would just be like, fuck yeah, um, yeah. Escape from New York's amazing, whatever, man. Snake Plissken's the man. It's such a somber movie yeah. that it doesn't even have that fun action vibe. Which is what I didn't remember because I just watched Rambo, or should I say, <laughs> sorry, first Rambo First Blood Part 2, which I think has a very similar plot but is more effective in the way it goes about it. It's very... Well, that was co-written by Escape from New York veteran James Cameron. There you go, exactly, <laughs> yep. And I find that to be, like, it has more, um, like, a joie de vivre going on right. in it. And I think part of that is colored by A... A lot of us haven't seen this film since Escape from L.A., so we're being colored by that. Yeah. And also, we have this strong memory of what the 80s action movies were like. Yes. But yeah, actually sitting down and watching it. And it's a weird, it falls into a weird place. You're thinking back to like the 80s and you're thinking Tears for Fears, but you're getting Joy Division, where it's just a much <laughs> more somber affair. <laughs> yes. I shouldn't say it doesn't quite work. It's just, it's not what I was hoping for, 
it's not what I know that Carpenter's capable of also. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of great things he does here. It looks, I love the way the film is shot. Yeah. I think he is an expert at making, it does look like a cheap movie, but it doesn't look like as cheap of a movie as the movie actually is. It's got style. Exactly. Which goes a long way, yeah. It's slick, it's got atmosphere, it's memorable, it looks neat. Mm -hmm. He does things like, I can't make it look expensive, but I'll make it look neat. I'll take that. Another controversial thing, you could kind of say the same thing about Blade Runner. It looks amazing, but the plot is kind of not there. You'd be surprised how many of the people who made this movie worked on Blade Runner. I could see that. Most, yeah, as I was going through like all of the hair and makeup, the costuming department, a lot of the effects guys... A lot of them actually worked on Blade Runner, too. Which is a gorgeous film and yeah. really set the bar and tone for sci-fi films for, like, the next couple decades. Yeah. But it's not that amazing when you get right down to it. Yeah. You could, as an interesting scientific experiment, swap anime Steve Buscemi with Rutger Hauer in their respective <laughs> movies and see where those movies would go. I like this. Let's start editing. I want this on YouTube by tonight. Roy Batty versus Snake Plissken. That would be a good movie. <laughs> and then it ends up with them just going to a bar and sharing a drink over how much humanity's fucked them both over. Yeah, I was yes. going to say, <laughs> Roy Batty's a lot more thoughtful. And say that as if that's a bad thing? <laughs> no, I'm not saying that as if it's a bad thing. That's exactly where that story should go. So anyways, one last thing I want to talk about before we close is the novelization, mm-hmm. which I didn't get to finish. I still have like the last quarter of it. I was hoping to finish it yesterday, but I got caught up in things. He gets out. <laughs> yeah, I just I just wanted to just run you by a few things that I noticed while I was reading it. It's written by Mike McQuay, who is a sci-fi adventure novelist who, among a lot of original works, also wrote installments of the long-running Executioner and Mac Balan series. He sadly passed away in 1995 in his mid-40s. It's a fantastic read. I think his prose is really sharp and really interesting. I mean, like, I actually tweeted a nice quote from it of, his eyes were like two piss holes in the snow. (laughs) Nice. That's a great description. He just captures a lot of the feel and energy, but it is a book that fleshes the story out a lot, in some ways that are really neat and in some ways that are probably a bit controversial. Probably the most controversial bit is a significant effect of the war are these massive amounts of nerve gas, which were released on both sides, which, while they have dissipated to non-lethal amounts, still cause damage to the brains of people, which actually led to rampant outbreaks of insanity. And New York was actually created as basically an asylum to throw away all the insane people. But it's also to ignore the fact that most of the brutal police force are themselves having been driven insane. Hmm. I don't like this because it gives too much of a reason for why everyone's acting crazy instead of just, it's a fascistic police state and they've been locked in a prison. Yeah. One part of this I do like is that while he was on one of his missions, one lens of his gas mask was cracked so the nerve gas got straight in Snake Plissken's eye. Uh So he still has an eye, but it's left in this kind of poisoned chronic pain state. So he's always in pain and always worrying that he'll fall insane because of that exposure. Interesting. And among the tools that Snake brings into New York is a rock of crystal meth that he keeps nibbling corners off of in order to keep himself going. (laughs) Interesting. Because apparently that's something they just give to soldiers in the future is just here's a rock of crystal meth if you need it. (laughs) Fair enough. Just chew it like candy. (laughs) I've got a lot of questions about that, but I'll let that slide. (laughs) There's like actually one little quote here about his backstory that I just want to read. It's just two quick paragraphs. This just tells you so much about his backstory without really going into it in too heavy of detail. They had sent him home, but there wasn't a home to go to. Some crazies had taken his home and held his parents hostage. The USPF didn't care a whole lot about that. They just went in with their flamethrowers and took out everybody. They buried his parents together in a pauper's grave, then the state took away all their savings. They tied them all together with the criminals and said that their money would be used for restitution. The day that Snake Plissken came home, he blew up a state vehicle with a Molotov cocktail. It was the only thing that made him feel any better. He had done something of the like every day since then. Hmm. That's a nice way of like slipping in a nice exploration of what's been happening in the world with why he suddenly went from being a soldier to just a pissed off, let's just blow up, you know, fuck this country type guy. Mm -hmm. And also getting in this very sad backstory of his parents were taken hostage and they just blew everyone away. There's interesting little bits like that that are peppered throughout the novel. I think it's a very good adaptation, and I know that they were actually hoping to do more novels. Mike McQuay was actually planning to do Escape from L.A., but then he died. I think it's absolutely worth checking out. It's actually very easy to find because they did bring it back in print, I want to say, like a decade or two ago. Because there was that period there around like the early 2000s where they were trying to relaunch the franchise, 
CrossGen was releasing a line of the comics. They were planning a video game that never came together. They were planning a third movie that never came together. It was like there was this failed attempt to relaunch the franchise. So the book is actually pretty easy to track down. I do recommend it. It gets a little too much into the whole everyone's been made driven insane by this nerve gas, but it's a good crackling, good read. And it's, it's very short. It's just over 200 pages long. And one of the other interesting things, though, because I haven't finished the book, I didn't see how this finally paid off. When Hauk took the job of warden, it was because his son was incarcerated in New York, and he maintains the job at the city because he keeps hoping to one day see his son and find out what happened to him. Hmm. And when Snake goes in, Hauk asks him to watch for a young man with the last name of Hauk tattooed to his knuckles. You know that bit where Snake is being chased by the crazies and he goes into the apartment and he literally blows off a guy's hand? Yeah. That hand splats to the floor and he sees the name Hawk written on the back of the knuckles. Oh, uh, nice. So I haven't finished the book in terms of what he actually tells Hawk about that situation, but it's like, okay, he built that story just to build an entire backstory for that guy who gets his hand blown off that one. <laughs> so, but otherwise, I don't have much else to say about Escape from New York. Anyone else got anything they want to add? Nope. Just call me Snake. <laughs> Well, then I think our next film is going to be Halloween 2. Cruise Control. <laughs> yes. The Journey Home. All right, cool. I haven't seen that one in a long time. We've got Halloween 2, and then I am finally going to start getting up the podcast for John Ocrafa. So that's what's coming up on our schedule. And so, Kevin, you won't be with us next month for Halloween 2, but right after that, we got The Thing, which we'll have you back for. I'm there. So anyways, I believe that concludes another episode of Masters of Carpentry. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. <laughs>